Welcome back to another episode of the Engineering Future Podcast. I'm your host, Luis Duque. And this week, I bring a conversation with Stephanie Donner. She is uh, an engineer that has turned her, her career into helping other engineers find their passion and, her, and their career. So it was great talking to her. She is a mother. She is an entrepreneur. She's an engineer, which is amazing to hear all the things that she's doing in her career. I was very happy that I got to talk to her and I really learned a lot from her. In this episode, we just touched a lot on on how to become better engineers, especially early on in our careers, and how do we approach maybe an interview and approach networking and all these things that we are we know we should be doing when we're trying to find a job but a lot of times we fail to do so stay tuned for this episode i know you're gonna enjoy the conversation with stephanie and i was really happy to get to know her and bring her to the podcast so before we start today's episode let me tell you about ppi ppi is one of the best resources on the internet for the fe pe and the se exam they have thousands and thousands of practice problems, practice exams, books, and in general, a lot of resources for you to study and pass your exam guarantee. So if you go to ppi2pass.com slash duke, you're able to get 15% discount on their products. That's ppi2pass.com slash duke for 15% discount on their products. And again, thank you, Audible, for being a sponsor of the show and make sure you check them out for one of the biggest libraries online for audiobooks, podcasts, stories, and a lot of more content beyond audiobooks. And make sure you use the code engineering our future or go to audibletrial.com slash engineering our future to get a free month of audible premium on top of a free audiobook for you to give them a try. A book that I rec- an audiobook that I recommend is She Engineers. I've, I've talked about this book in the past. It's a book by Stephanie Slocum. She is an amazing structural engineer that started her own company where she's helping women engineering and other young engineers succeed in their careers and, and help them become more intentional and better engineers overall. I'm actually going to have her in a future episode on the podcast, so make sure you subscribe to hear a lot of her background and a lot of the great things that she has to share with us about her book and all the things that she's doing. Again, go to audibletrial.com slash engineeringourfuture. Without further ado, let's jump right into the conversation for the day. Welcome to the Engineering Our Future podcast, a podcast where I bring you relevant content from personal experience and guests to help young engineers, students, and international students succeed in their careers. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Engineering of Future podcast. Today, I have Stephanie with me. She is doing some great work in her career. I just wanted to bring her to a podcast to share all the great things she's doing. Um, Stephanie, do you want to give us a brief introduction and and what are you doing and what have you been out to these days? Sure. My name is Stephanie Hurtado Leonard. I am a chemical engineer by trade. I graduated in 2009 from Missouri s and from a small town in Missouri, Rolla, Missouri. Uh, there are not many Hispanics there. And I got introduced to an organization, SHIP, S-H-P-E, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. I'm a lifetime member of that, and I've been involved for 14 years with that organization. I volunteer in every capacity. Um, I enjoy volunteering work for promoting STEM fields. I'm also a mother of two and just recently moved to Huntsville, Alabama. I have moved uh, quite a bit in my career and also when I was a child. And um, for eight years, I've been in oil and gas as an engineer. My last position was a project manager. And just recently, about three years ago, I started a technical recruitment firm. And uh, I quite enjoy it because Uh, I get to work with a lot of engineers and advising them on career advancement um, and also help them along the way when they negotiate um, any offers, job offers, and I also match them with corporations. And so it's a lot of um, things that I would have loved that a career agent would be uh, along my side to be on my team. So I really, really enjoy being in this side now and helping out uh, engineers just like me. So with that being said, uh, most most of the questions that I get asked is why did I 
create a technical recruitment firm by being just an engineer. And I said that I was approached uh, by a lot of headhunters when I was an engineer and I got laid off a couple times. And with that experience that headhunters uh, were a good resource, except the way that they handle things was very transactional. It was more, let's just make the sales end it there. There's no coaching whatsoever. It was, I realized quickly that the candidates are not the clients. They're not the target audience. It was the corporations that were the clients. So I wanted to change that gap in the hiring process where the engineer and the corporation is a win-win situation where they get the same treatment, right? So that is that is my motive. Yeah, that's great. I, I recently found Chip uh, through Fernando Cevaj. I'm sure she, you have heard of him. Uh, he I had him early here on the podcast and he kind of entered into the organization and uh, being a Latino, I didn't know there was such a big um, representation of Latinos in STEM. So that was great to find. And since then, I've just been finding other engineers and finding kind of new friends through through this journey. So that's an organization I've been, I've been involved with for a few months now and just very happy to, to find it. And I know they're doing a lot of great work with Latinos here oh, wow. in, in STEM and in the U.S. And um, it's it's a part of STEM that it's really needed. I mean, as a Latino, you kind of hear stories of oh, yes. people kind of dropping off school and it's kind of sad to to see all the challenges that Latinos kind of face um, in this country. What was your experience coming um, as a Latino, as a Latina here in, in the U.S., kind of entering college and entering kind of the career in STEM? Well, uh, my inspiration came from my mom. Uh, she studied electrical engineering in Ecuador. Uh, with that being said, when she moved to the U.S., uh, she had me and she had to give up her career. Uh, so she didn't get the opportunity to use her career at all. So in, with that being said, also, he, she instilled in me that I should be an engineer my whole life. She trained me from having puzzle games, chess, everything, you name it, anything that was... Uh, mathematics uh, driven that I should be uh, exposed to. So when I was in high school in Missouri, uh, I moved from New York City. That's another thing that my family and I, we moved every three to four years. We didn't really have a, and I'm a single child. So we moved quite a bit. And when I moved to Missouri, I stood out quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> From, from it was a quite a culture shock because you come from New York City in a melting pot of cultures, and then going to St. Louis, Missouri, to you really are a minority. Um, it's quite an impact. So the programs that um, that were given to the students there, I was not in a struggling student. Uh, was not in a struggling school. It was about two thousand students in that high school. They were all competitive. Everybody wanted to be lawyers and in medicine. So one day I I had to, I was a junior in high school and I, and my parents said, if you want to go to college, you do realize that we won't be able to afford it. So you, one, you need a car to even go to college and then another thing is you need scholarships and how are you going to get scholarships so in high school they made an announcement one time that motivated me that said a minority emerson um, emerson minority scholarship and it just i was just mm -hmm. quite surprised why would they announce it in this school if i'm the only minority however when i got um you know, I don't know if they still do that in schools where they actually make in the speaker phone, the speaker, they make announcements every morning, but that's what they used to do in high school for me uh, a couple of days, decades ago. <laughs> so uh, when I heard that, uh, I researched more into it and I actually applied. And that year, I was one of the few handful people that actually applied. So as a Latina, I was quite surprised to hear that if you don't apply to a scholarship, you might might be missing out 
because you might be one of the few applicants and right away get it. Little did I know that this was more of a full ride package <laughs> scholarship. And because of this scholarship, I didn't pay a penny for four years. I went to college for five years. The fifth year I, I had to pay out of pocket, but that saved tremendously. I would have not gone in college if, if it wasn't because of that scholarship. So I'm very grateful. So when I went to, so the package included community college and a four-year college. So when I went to four-year college in Rolla, Missouri, which was now University of Missouri Rolla, I was one of the few people. I did look for any more Hispanics and that's how I learned about SHIP. And in which SHIP, when I was in college, it made it a lot easier that familia, that you belong to something. It's just like for guys, a brotherhood, a sisterhood, right? Um, as an only child, it seemed like I seeked for that because I always used to go to Ecuador for Christmas and having 11 cousins on each side was what I missed at big family gatherings. So the few handful of people that I met in Rala that were Hispanic through ship um, just elevated me. It just inspired me to even get to keep on going. Why? Because it said, it meant that I can do, if they can do it, I can do it. They kept saying that. You, you can do it. And they even had a program ship within ship. They had a high school recruitment program called Si Se Puede. And I love that, that, that program, I volunteer to mentor for one week, high school students to immerse themselves into engineering. And ever since then, I've never stopped for 14 years. I've been active in those type of programs since that day. So as a Latina, I would say that if you look for it, you will find the resources. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't really have, I mean, there were actually quite a bit of Latinos where, where I went to school in South Dakota, but there wasn't like a ship organization kind of in that area. Um, but I can relate a lot with like big families. I have, I lost count, I, 30, 40, maybe even 50 cousins and have like eight or nine aunts and uncles on either side of my my family yes. and like my cousins we probably have i have two kids and they have like maybe like 15 second cousins like it's we have a really really big family so that's something i really miss um like going back to colombia and spending time with them and um especially when, like when i first got here like it's it's kind of lonely when you first get here and and it's kind of yes um hard to find people that you can relate with the culture and, and all the difference, like it's, it's hard at the beginning. So totally relate with that. It's, it's definitely really hard at the beginning. Um, so yes. you start your company to recruit engineers, to help place engineers in the right companies and find the right engineers to, uh, to the right companies. Um, like from what you have done in the, in the near past, what skills do, do those engineers kind of need to develop to get to those companies? Oh, quite a bit of uh, skills. First is people skills. <laughs> engineers trying to coach them on first how to negotiate an offer, especially Latinos. Uh, because of my network, I have tons of Latinos engineers coming towards me because I've been exposed in the organization so far and other ones. Um, I'm also involved in FIRST Robotics. So I've met quite a bit of engineers there that are mentors, not the students, mentors. So I, I was a judge in the competitions as well. So um, so I would say that number one, the this, this most sought skills is the leadership skills. And by that, I mean, if are you empathetic? Are you a person that can prioritize your time? Are you a good planner? And then first of all, are you reliable? Can you really just show up on time? And you would think that that's a very obvious thing, but a lot of employers say, you know, it just doesn't work out. <laughs> he just, especially Latinos, we have that culture where 
Ah, if they said six o'clock, they really mean like six ten or six twenty. So that that's a very uh, honed skill that we have to really uh, work on. And <clears throat> a lot of employers too, they what they really want is a work a strong work ethic. And you would think that's another one that is obvious, but in order to show that in an interview that's quite hard because you only have a limited time to show that and the way that you show it is by storytelling and you would think that a lot of people wouldn't struggle with that but several of the candidates that are in engineering fields do struggle with that because where do they practice <laughs> how do they practice they get the job they do the data they sit in front of the computer design all the equipment and or they're civil engineers and they're in construction sites and all you got to do is a lot more than just the interview skills so um i would say that a lot of the candidates that come to me you'd be surprised on the age difference several of them are 40 years old plus and they're not <laughs> you would think that oh well they'd be already experienced with interview skills. But you know, backing up, they're not experienced how to market themselves in the social platforms. Because it's a new era of even placing the LinkedIn URL on your resume. It, where where <laughs> do you learn that? <laughs> and they said, Stephanie, I have to put this long <laughs> URL on the, on the resume. Yes, it's an unwritten rule. <laughs> it's it's a known thing now, but every five years it changes um, how to make a good resume, how to write one. So I would say a lot of skills are needed for a good candidate. I would say first you have to attract the interview. So resume skills, interview skills, um, how to market yourself. All those skills are first and foremost needed in order to shine. And then the rest, you can work on it by with time. Yeah, that that's a really good point. I've been helping um, craft resumes with students and I say half of them don't even add their LinkedIn profile or don't even have a LinkedIn profile. It's like, you should know this. Like, you need to have a LinkedIn profile. That's how you find a job in 2020. Like. People are looking on LinkedIn more than they look at the resume. So add your, add your LinkedIn, even if it's just like find me on LinkedIn and just write your name, how you have, like you, you can have edit your URL and just add that right there. Super important. Yes. And just before you said, I thought it was super interesting that you also help more experienced engineers in their oh, 40s yes. and 50s. What, what's been that difference between the ones that maybe have worked for many years trying to find a job again? Uh, compared to maybe students or young engineers that are finding a job for the first time? Number one problem is how to condense 13 pages of resume <laughs> experience to two or three pages. That's the number one problem. Second problem is I get a lot of the engineers who do not want to be a manager and who just want to be a technical person. Um, number three is how do they get how do they market themselves? Because right off the bat, if they already say, or if a lot of recruiters see the year that they graduate from college, they can already age them and calculate how much they're worth, right? And number four is they always ask me, what is their worth in the market? And that always varies. It varies by location. It varies by the specialization of their jobs. And it varies by the company and how they're doing on the company, the company's performance. Um, and then fourth is the market, right? How are they doing, especially oil and gas right now? A lot of people don't know that in oil and gas, because of the layoffs, because how oil is doing, that salaries have decreased. So they're going to be in big shock when they go back to the job market right now, that companies are not offering as high salaries as where you used to be used to. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's super interesting. So are you still working in the oil and gas industry or are you just focused on your um, technically minded business? 
So Technically Minded Talent was created uh, for ever since 2017 when my firstborn was born. Um, I got laid off the year before that and uh, from Anadarko and I said to myself, I must do something mm -hmm. because that year, 2016, there were a huge flux of um, candidates and they were all coming to me for help. And companies were, I, I had a lot of industry connections. So I had to make, I was doing already pro bono, uh, a lot of the connections. So I said to myself, this takes a lot of time. So I might have to, uh, you know, now that I have a newborn with me, I it's a sacrifice to take time out of that, of being a parent and then, um, doing the pro bono volunteering thing. So uh, I said to myself, yeah, I, I have to make a business out of this. Yeah. So that, that, that's how I started. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's a, it's a really needed business. I think from just from, from my perspective, I know, I mean, th there's definitely a lot of great recruiters, but having an engineer that has experience in the field already that has gone through the interview process as an engineer and everything, helping other engineers get into engineering companies. I mean, makes, makes a lot of sense. And, um, I think it's a, it's a great, um, business that, that you're working on. So let's, let, thank you. Yeah, definitely. And I honestly hadn't heard before until I met you. Um, so I'm happy to help in anything I can. If I find people that are looking for jobs, can I send it your way? Definitely. Um, of course. And, yes. Um, yeah, any, anything, anything I can do to help. Uh, let, let's move into uh, right now with COVID. A lot of interviews are done are being doing online. A lot of career fairs are, are being done online. How how have you seen the shift in maybe uh, preparation or mindset for students that are looking, or, or even like young engineers that are looking for jobs? How is that interview process or even a career fair, and how they can better prepare to affront like a Zoom conversation like this? I would say it's hard. Right now, it's all hard. It's a new territory where we're navigating right now. And I would say that even companies are learning how to do this. So I would say that don't feel so, uh, don't be so hard on yourself as a candidate because even companies are trying to figure it out how they can do it better and what's the good, what's the good way or what's the best way to what, what's even the best platform, right, to use for interviews. Um, I would say that virtual career fairs are not leading. <laughs> They're here to stay. I agree. Why? Why? Because companies pay a lot of money for recruiting on an annual basis. You have to take in consideration hotel. The whole team that they take, they probably take about five to 10 people at minimum the the time for each person the the convention center the supplies the registration for the conference all of that adds up and you will think maybe they go to two conferences a year or three the whole recruitment team is not only hr but also engineers salaries for that whole week and then they have to source uh, source candidates Oh, that money compared to virtual platform where they don't have to do all those expenses, you would think about 80 grand a year they're saving. And with platform, it's going to stay. So I would say that get used to it. And uh, the best way to prepare it is to do a lot of practice, just like in person. So I would say grab a buddy and start and start practicing online just with these Zoom calls and and get comfortable in front of the camera and always look at in front of the camera because it's not going to change. It's a lot cheaper to do virtual conversations, virtual interviews, and and also the uh, the job hunting is gonna get all automated as well. So all of that is, it's an introduction. Yeah, I, I know even for like volunteering, it's so much easier just to have a call like this with maybe engineers all over the U.S. and try to find a time that works to 
fly to a place and, and meet at a certain place. So I, I know in the things that I volunteer with, there's a lot of value just in these calls because we're traveling less, we're saving money, we're saving time. So I think a lot of people are, even though we'll probably have a lot of fatigue from having so many Zoom calls, and on the yeah. long run, we're probably going to be thankful that we're having these Zoom calls rather than traveling hundreds or thousands of miles across the country to have these conversations. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so another question I had for you is, sure. um, what is the secret to small talk? I thought that was really interesting that you shared that with me, and I just was super curious to hear your take on that. What's the secret of small talk? Um but in what way? What 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 are you more curious? Because I gave a whole workshop about this. <laughs> For me, it's really hard to have a small talk. How do I? Oh, yeah. So I'm I'm an introvert. I'm an engineer. As as many engineers, we're introverts. But hey, you're hosting a podcast. Exactly. I'm proud of you. <laughs> I am proud of you. But at the same time, yeah, I'm an introvert. But I enjoy having these conversations. I enjoy having go having deep conversations with people. That's kind of my introverted side saying, I don't like the small talk, but I like to have a lot of these conversations, kind of one-on-one, -on -one, like deep conversations, getting to know each other. How do I start the conversation with someone I don't really know? And maybe we don't really have a lot of in common. And there's like that five to 10 minutes with this super awkward, hey, how are you? Oh, what do you do for a living? It's kind of that small talk. How do I maybe get past that faster and start getting the more substantial part of the conversation three things uh always find something relatable that you instantly observe physically or current current status and by that i mean people always like recognition and compliments um so if you say hey i bet there's a story behind those earrings bam a prompt for her or him <laughs> to talk about it. For guys, could be a watch. I bet there's a story behind that. If there's a, if it's a unique looking watch, of course. Um, the second thing is a current status. What I mean by that is anything that is surrounding. So, as I mentioned before, I used to move a lot um, cities. So here in Huntsville. I would say if I'm in a conference room with a coworker that oh she came in or he came in five minutes before me and she's just or he is sitting alone by themselves. Oh, I gotta strike a conversation. So I usually talk about any construction projects that is going on around the neighborhood. Hey, what do you think they're going to construct around the corner? You think it's a, gonna be a grocery store or a movie theater? And there you have it. He or she is going to say right away, actually, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. But you know what? It will be nice to know the grocery store. And from there, you can take it off. Uh, always avoid yes or no questions. Why? Because it just stops there, right? That's where the awkward silence comes in. And that's it. Um, <laughs> the rest, it comes easy. If you just breathe in and breathe out, and think there's not going to be any judgment here is it's just with a conversation you start a relationship do you have any resources that we can link for people that are interested in learning more about that um i would say any video on youtube on ted talks about it it will be your best resource but i don't have any specific ones my experience and the reason why I consider myself an expert in small talk is I've, it's all practice. It's yeah. the more you do it, the better you get it. <laughs> I, I, it's, it comes natural to me. And I think I've done it ever since I was four years old when we used to be able to switch spots in our, on airplanes. And I used to just go up to people and say, are you married? Are, do you study? <laughs> oh, how many kids do you have? Huh? I see. There's a watch there. Yeah, I'm I'm terrified of small talk. I still am. I can. Oh. This podcast has really helped me get into a better rhythm. Like like you said, just practice uh, meeting new people, having new conversations. But at conferences and like networking events, I'm just terrified of approaching people and just have the small talk. Um, the faster <laughs> I can get through that, the better 
uh, the better off I am. But it's so hard for me to kind of get into that small talk and then kind of go beyond that. I crave introverted people. <laughs> I guess that that is one of the reasons I created this business because they should call me the nerd wrangler <laughs> because I really enjoy uh, just getting a smile out of introverts. And they said, whoa, you've really changed me in one second. <laughs> Cause, um, a joke could be an, also in an introduction in a small talk. I'm a big joker and that, that comes with the Latin closure, you know? Have you read the book by Susan Cain, Quiet? No, I have not. You should read that book. It's wonderful. Um, I'm, it's mainly for introverts, kind of the difference between introverts and extroverts. And it really opened my mind to how my brain works and maybe ways that I can uh, change the way I think and the way I approach like small talks or even when I present huh. to big people, like big crowds or even for this podcast has helped me like a lot to better prepare and better understand how my brain works. Because um, being an introvert doesn't mean that I'm, I'm going to be quiet or I'm going to be uh, all these things that are very well known uh, in society. It means more that I, I'm more interested in the deep conversations and I'm more interested in maybe recharging my energy when I'm by myself. So having this conversation is always going to take a lot of energy out of me. So maybe after that, I can just go lay on bed, lay in bed and maybe read a book just by myself, recharge. But it doesn't mean that I am afraid of like talking to big crowds or I'm not afraid to share all the things that I'm doing. It just means that the amount of energy that I have after such events, it's going to be a lot less than an extrovert. The extrovert is going to build their energy when they're doing the big talks, the big conferences, meeting a lot of people. Um, but for me, those are really draining. Like I'm so tired after a conference that I just need to go to the hotel, lay in bed for a little bit and recharge a little bit. So it's a great book. I really recommend it. I think I, I spoke okay. it. I, I mentioned this book like every episode because that conversation kind of keeps coming up. And it's funny to see that a lot of engineers, even though they're introverts, they have all these great things. I know people that have YouTube channels, all their podcasts volunteer, have conversations and everything, but we're all introverts. We just learn to channel our energy and and kind of get past the misconception that we're just quiet and we don't like to talk in public. So really great book right. if you if you have a chance to read it. Sounds good. Will do. Um, so moving on from kind of the career stuff, I wanted to ask you as a mom, as an engineer, how do you balance um, family time with work and now that we probably work from home a lot of the time how is that relationship between when it's time to work and when it's time to spend time in family oh i would say that i'm a time management queen uh, because i i do a lot right um at one point i was doing volunteering work and ship i had my business i also had my two kids i have two kids young uh and under the age of three so that's a full time <laughs> by itself. And then um, I'm a wife and a devoted daughter as well. My mom, I also take care of my mom. So, <clears throat> and on top of that, um, we have suffered a uh, job loss, a uh, job loss between my husband and I. So we have moved quite a bit. So for instance, when I got laid off, I found out I was pregnant the next day. Wow. And that same year, uh, when I was going to give birth, just two, uh, two months shy, they laid off my husband. That's how the oil gas business is so cyclical. So we had to do something really quick to just change jobs and find a job because we need income. Uh, so that was 2016. That was quite stressful. So we had a move. We had to find jobs and everything it was I, I think there's a book about that where if you experience all five things because in that same year my husband also found out that his mom had stage four cancer and within a couple months she, she passed away so it was a tremendous hardship three years ago where we went through so from time management it was really critical i never had time management before kids 
you have to have <laughs> discipline and discipline is what my firstborn taught me. And also he was my inspiration to build this business. So I would say that number one is priority your family. Number two is how to support the family with your income. So I, my schedule is my family. I'm a stay home mom first. And then my business, I do from 4 PM to 10 PM. So I make calls, answer emails. I don't do it during the day and then, uh, ship work that I used to be the regional vice president of region six, which uh, oversaw nine states. Any questions that came through, I would always answer it at night. Um, people would say, you know, I never can get a hold of you in the morning. <laughs> morning, now that my kid is in preschool, you never see me online. So you have to turn off your phone completely and dedicate to one single thing at a time. Why? Because if you try to do a couple things at a time, you won't be successful in that particular one. You have to dedicate one thing at a time. So I am a stay home mom from specific time to another time. And then I do my recruiting business. And then I help my mom on the weekends, period. So as organized as possible, otherwise you overwhelm yourself and you're very important to your family, to your company and to everything else you do. So you have to play that role pretty. And I know that that sounds easier than done, but let me tell you, it took me some time to, yeah. <laughs> to get to this point. So I think it's wonderful that you dedicate your most of your day until 4 p.m. to your family. And I think that's very yes. valuable because at least here in the U.S., I mean, the culture is you need to be working 24 7 yeah and yeah i think for us um as latinos a lot of times i know work kind of is, is second uh, uh, behind the family so the fact that you will continue that culture uh from from being a latina to your business and your family i think it's it's a wonderful thing that i know a lot of people um will value a lot and and it's going to be a, a, just a great example for the people that it can be done if you put the time and you oh, put yeah. the effort. Oh yeah, and and also it takes a a whole village <laughs> to raise a family, right? So even though I help my mom, my help my dad helps me with the kids when I need him as well. So like for example, when if there's an important call that a company just cannot wait and I have to schedule it, I ask my dad to help me with the kids. Because two kids, it's a lot harder than just looking out for one kid. Yeah. I, and nowadays, you just give them the tablet. Mm, no, uh, you can't do that to a one-year-old. Or <laughs> Trust me, my kids cannot be in front of the TV for longer than five minutes. So I, I need at least a half an hour <laughs> to 40 minutes of quiet. Otherwise, they go old Jumanji on me <laughs> if I start one single call. So um Yes, I, I plan it really good in advance or I, I do ask for help when it comes to the kids. Yeah. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't happen. I, I won't be able, I can't say that I'm a superwoman and say, you know, I take the calls with the kids around. No, I don't <laughs> do that. <laughs> That's a huge risk. I think it's also super important what you just said, that seeking for help whenever you need it, like having that that clear mind that, even though you're capable of doing it, if you ask for help, it's just going to be a little easier. Oh, yes. I actually have two little kids who under three, so I kind of relate a lot with what you're saying. Uh, I'm very <laughs> thankful that just the circumstances with COVID and everything, my, my wife is actually home with them, watching them, but there is always our, our oldest is two and a half, so he always runs into the office and just wants to grab me and wants to play. So it, it's fun to have them around, but it's kind of hard to balance the two when you're trying to do the two. So the fact that you are putting your family first, I think is wonderful. It's a great example that it's possible for for people right now that are at home. Uh, and, and I think it's just a wonderful 
uh, witness to show other people that even though you have a family and maybe you have a business that you have to work on, there's time for both. And and I'm very grateful you shared that story here in the podcast. And, and I yeah thank you so much for sharing that. Of course. And I would say that it, it takes it takes a lot of support to make this happen. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say that in a lot of communication with your partner too. So it's best to say we're gonna plan this X and hopefully we can have the kids do this while we're 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 taking turns. When my husband found a contract job right after he was laid off he would have, he was working at home and I was trying to control the kids to just lower down <laughs> their voices under three. It's impossible. impossible. They scream like, um, like Jumanji is, <laughs> it's, it's like monkeys. They want to be Superman, they, Spider-Man. They like to climb the walls. So uh, in the middle of phone calls of my husband, you have to just control <laughs> the noise level. So, if he when he had conference calls, I would I would time it that I would go to the library and then I will come back. And if it was winter, you know, it, it, it all depends on the on the weather too. And I would I would try to pack and plan all the meal plans also the night before. So it takes a lot of planning. So if you plan it right, it will it will do good. <laughs> yeah, that's that's so in the true. long run. Yeah, it's it's hard to be a, a new parent we're still trying to figure out with two kids at home it's the the amount of kids is double but the work is like four times as much for some oh, reason yes. and every week it changes too it's like you figure out one month and then the next month you're like you know i got this <laughs> and then where did this come from how did he know how to take off his diaper by himself <laughs> you know it's just a are disaster <gasps> Yeah, no potty training, all those stages. They don't teach you that in college. Yep. I mean, some I would think that sometimes I even say, you know, parenting is a lot harder than than engineering school. Actually, to be even honest with you, I was in oil and gas and drilling rigs when I first started my career, and I was the only woman with forty guys on the platform. That's nothing compared <laughs> to having two kids. <laughs> Yep. Run around without diapers and hoping that there's no accidents. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, so, it's it's hard, but it's a wonderful thing to have. Just be a parent and and have kids around. It's it's always fun. It's always an adventure. I keep I keep telling myself that when I have public tantrums. Too. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> those are the best. Yep. <laughs> And hopefully that no one calls social services on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stephanie, thank you so much for being here at the First podcast. Um, I think what you're doing with your family, your business, your career, it's wonderful. Um, I just have one more question for you, and that's sure. how can we continue engineering our future? How can we continue engineering our future? That's a very good one, a very unique one. Um, I would say that don't give up on your goals. Always listen to older and experienced people. And by listening, I don't say just hear them out, but pay attention to their stories and the messages they want to provide you. Why? Because they went through the same age that you went through and probably the same experiences. So you might want to hear them out. You might be able to relate. That sounds great. That's that's some great advice. Again, thank you so much for being here at the podcast. Thank you so much for all the things you're doing with SHIP, with your career, um, a witness for other moms that it's possible to have a career and a family at the same time and balancing the two of them. Uh, where can people find you online and reach out to you if they have any other questions? Sure. You can find me on LinkedIn, Stephanie Urtao Lonard. You can visit my website, technicallymindedtalent.com, or you can even find me on Instagram, technicallymindedtalent, and also through Stephanie Lawner. Sounds Thank good. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for coming to the podcast. So there you have it. That's a conversation with Stephanie. She's a great person, a Latina, which is amazing to find other Latinas and other 
Hispanics in, in the profession since I'm originally from Colombia so I really resonate and connect with all that she's doing and just being a parent and trying to do your side business like she's doing I was really blown away by the fact that she doesn't really work during the day so she can spend some time with her children and after that she just put the hours basically at night which was really impressive to hear but that just shows you that her priorities are it's her family and then her career which is uh, great to see how she's balancing that if you like the episode make sure to subscribe to, to the show on apple podcast spotify everywhere you listen to podcasts and read and review the podcast you really help get the word out there share with someone you think is going to get some value out of this and yeah that's it for now uh, remember to subscribe to your newsletter that's something that i've been doing recently and i'm just sharing a lot of great content every week about what I'm doing with the podcast and about all the things kind of going on around my career. Thank you so much for coming back to this episode. I'll talk to you in the next one. But for now, let's continue engineering our future.